we design AI that will teach itself how to drive a car? Welcome to Tech First with John Goods here. Self-driving cars will unlock trillions in market value and probably change our lives, right? Opening the door to fractional car ownership, probably better ride sharing, maybe even cars that pay for themselves. They'll also give us back months, if not years of our time that we currently spend sitting in a car going places. But they're hard to train. Tesla might have the most data. Google's Waymo is a leader as well. What about if we build an AI that learns unsupervised, maybe based on dash cam video? Helm.ai is pioneering what it calls deep teaching. And we're going to chat with CEO Vlad Vorniski. Welcome, Vlad. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Your self-driving system is driving on roads that it's never seen before. How's it doing that? Yeah, um, I would say uh, similarly to how humans are able to drive on roads they've never seen, in the sense that uh, deep neural networks are capable of learning arbitrary concepts, um, including to some degree a generalization to new environments. Um, the bottleneck really to training these systems um, is that annotated data is very expensive. But if you can train them on enough data, you actually get pretty good generalization performance. Um, at Helm AI, we're able to achieve that uh, using our deep teaching technology, uh, which trains without human annotation or simulation. Um, and it's on a similar level of effectiveness as supervised learning, which allows us to actually achieve a high level of accuracy, as well as generalization, um, uh, more so than the traditional methods. Right. Right. Before we dive into what exactly that technology looks like and how it works, maybe give a general comment um, to, to kick off. How hard a problem, how thorny a problem is it self, to create a car that's self-driving? Absolutely. Um, so simply achieving um, a system that has safety levels on par with a human is actually fairly tractable. Uh, in part because human failure modes are uh, somewhat preventable, you know, things like inattention or uh, aggressive driving, et cetera. Um, but in, in truth, that even achieving that level of safety is not sufficient to launch a scalable uh, fleet. Uh, really what you need is something that's much safer than a human. Uh, it needs to be fully interpretable uh, for liability reasons, highly scalable, you know, the ability to kind of go into new places, uh, you know, very quickly and highly cost effective and achieving all of these things simultaneously is quite hard. Yeah. Um, the really the you know the primary driving factor for all of these variables is really the sophistication of your AI stack. Um, you know the more accuracy it has the safer the endpoint system will be, uh, the more broad the capability, uh, the more interpretable it becomes. Um, you know the more flexible the AI is, the more scalable it is um, mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. being able to do things without uh, kind of you know teleoperation or uh, you know using computer vision instead of lidar allows you to build an ultimately cheaper stack um, and so so really AI is the bottleneck and, and in particular uh, what the bottleneck is is kind of a huge number of these AI sub problems that have to be solved at human levels of accuracy um, and each one of them is really kind of too expensive to be solved completely using the well-known approaches. Um, so, you know, inherently cutting edge R&D is required uh, mm -hmm. to get there. And so, you know, humans, uh, you know, when they're actually, you know, when paying attention and not being too aggressive or, or, or inebriated, uh, we're actually quite good at driving in the sense <laughs> that uh, we're able to... Good to know. Right. <laughs> um, empirically. Um, you know, we're able to basically um, observe entirely unforeseen situations, interpret them kind of in the nick of time, and uh, apply our knowledge of the world to kind of make uh, an optimal decision, right? Uh, in totally unanticipated situations. Um, and, you know, to build a, cell, a fully self-driving car product that's scalable um, would require a similar level of sophistication from the AI system. And so even on the, you know, budgets of like tens of billions of dollars, it's not clear how to do that uh, when you're using the traditional methods. Yes. So talk about how your software is different than your competitors. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the software that we develop uh, as a function of our uh, proprietary uh, training methodology called deep teaching um, ends up having higher levels of accuracy, um, can generalize better to new situations, um, and handles more corner cases. Um, 
you know, essentially because the approach is highly capital efficient, um, we can build many more features than our competitors can. Um, you know, one example I can provide is, you know, we can uh, drive certain roads that uh, state of the art production systems cannot. Uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> if you've ever been on uh, Page Mill Road near Skyline Boulevard in the Bay Area, it's a highly curvy, steep mountain road. Uh, we're able to drive that with just one camera and one GPU. Um, and, you know, the neural network that we trained to understand that road uh, actually was never trained on data from that road, um, nor did we use any uh, human annotation or simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that certainly goes beyond the state of the art uh, of today's production systems. And, and so really, you know, the, the difference at the end of the day is really kind of the real time perception accuracy, the, the ability to interpret sensor data um, very quickly um, and uh, very, uh, very accurately. Um, and, you know, those, those advantages kind of carry across the board to many other functionalities uh, beyond sort of, you know, lens detection or run understanding can really be used for uh, any kind of object category. And talk about, um, the, you, you mentioned capital efficiency of your model. Uh, can you go into some more detail there? How is it so capital efficient? Uh, what, how, how have you been able to get so much training data? Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, you know, typically the way that uh, an AI system is trained, right, there's uh, some kind of uh, raw data coming in, let's say it's images. Uh, there are examples of some tasks being performed, uh, like there are annotations uh, provided along with the image that maybe some human actually labeled certain pixels for, uh, for what they are, um, and you train on that data. Now, the cost of the annotation becomes the bottleneck for improving the system very quickly because the cost of annotation is roughly dollars per image, uh, and these systems keep continuing to get to get better uh, into the you know billions or trillions of images. So it's not really possible to uh, to get the accuracy you want that way. And so you know the cost of annotation is about a hundred thousand x more than the cost of simply processing an image through a GPU. So wow. uh, yeah, so it's really quite a, quite a big difference. And so that's you know if you can come up with a learning technology that is on par with supervised training, but doesn't require the annotation, I'm talking about a hundred X, sorry, a hundred thousand X reduction in cost. So a hundred thousand X reduction in cost. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's, it's similar to what uh, we've seen, for example, in the biotechnology industry, right? So uh, the cost of mapping the human genome dropped a hundred thousand X over the course of 20 years. Right. So we've seen examples of that before uh, in AI. Uh, you know, I believe it's going to happen a lot more quickly uh, in, in the next few years. Um, and it's going to have, you know, even broader impacts, right, because it's going to be applying to many industries simultaneously. Talk a bit about deep teaching, um, uh, how you developed it, how it works um, and, and how you're using it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, so deep teaching is really a, a technology that we uh, invented at Helm and uh, combines certain tools and insights from applied mathematics uh, with deep neural networks uh, to effectively you know, teach them how to perform certain tasks without requiring human annotation or simulation. Um, so you know, the motivation actually stems to some degree uh, loosely from uh, an area that I worked in during, during my academic career called compressive sensing. Um, so to give an example, so, you know, science is full of these kind of reconstruction problems where you observe information, uh, indirect information about some object of interest, and you want to recover the structure of that object from that indirect information. So, for example, you know, a diffraction pattern in extra crystallography can be used to recover the electron density um, of, of a protein you're looking at or something like that. So that, that's, you know, for example, how DNA was discovered or the structure of DNA was discovered. Um, so, so compressive sensing uh, is an area of research which you know solves these reconstru reconstruction problems yes. with a lot less data than people kind of previously thought possible um, by incorporating certain structural assumptions about the object of interest um, into the reconstruction process. Um, so, you know, these techniques have been actually used to speed up MRI by a factor of ten, and mm. uh, you know, when combined with deep learning, more like a factor of hundred. It's so actually it's a proven technology with kind of uh, uh, far-reaching um, implications uh, in of itself. And, you know, with AI, what we have, right, are we're looking for a neural network that will perform some task well. That's the object of interest. And with supervised learning, you have these uh, training examples. It's kind of like 
indirect information uh, of, of how the task is performed. And uh, deep learning effectively uses that uh, to find the neural network. Now, um, you know, deep teaching is, uh, you know, is basically something that is able to still find this neural network without those training examples. And, you know, you have to kind of bring in new information somehow. So, you know, the information that we bring in are essentially uh, structural uh, assumptions about the data at hand. Certain, I mean, uh, if you're familiar with computer vision, certain, you know, just all principles, really kind of anything that we know about the world mm -hmm. that uh, strikes a good balance of being general enough to be useful every time, but, uh, you know, also quite informative. Um, so it's similar to compressive sensing in that sense on a very high level. Um, and, and yeah, so, you know, the challenge really is kind of, it's not just removing the need for annotation, it's also ensuring that there's enough learned per image, yeah. right? So you really have to bring in these kind of more sophisticated priors. Um, but if you can do that, then you're really kind of approaching that, uh, that cost reduction that we talked about earlier. Can you, give some, can you give some examples of those priors? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, essentially, you know, it can be anything that we know about the world. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about some basic stuff. I can't get into like the very detailed things, but, um, you know, the world is three-dimensional, right? We know that. Uh, we know that there is kind of temporal contiguity, spatial contiguity, um, essentially um, anything anything intuitive that you kind of know about the world to roughly be true, or there's, you know, roughly maybe 20 different things that the uh, that the brain uses uh, during the course of inference for vision that are well-known uh, principles. Um, and so, um, you know, in, in some ways, it's I can say kind of anything is up for, up for grabs, like any information you incorporate is up for grabs. The challenge is really uh, how to strike a balance again for, for how to get something that's that's going to be useful and re repeatedly useful across many different object categories and tasks and is simultaneously very informative. And that, that's the thing that I think we like really cracked with uh, deep teaching. Interesting. And so when I first, you know, heard you talk about those priors, I was thinking simpler, like objects or something like that, but you're actually talking about principles, maybe like object permanence or something like that. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's a good example. Yeah. Okay, good. Now you're not building a car yourself, right? Uh, what's your model? That's right. Um, uh, what we're looking to do is really to solve the critical, you know, AI piece of the puzzle for self-driving cars, um, and you know, license the resulting software to auto manufacturers and fleets. So we're like a typical supplier, but we only license software, yes. which means we're agnostic to the sensor configuration and the compute platform, and uh, we partner closely with our customers, which is really required for bring sophisticated autonomous driving features into production. Um, so you can sort of think about what we're doing as a kind of an Android model for self-driving cars. Interesting, can you talk about your customers? Are they public? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, some of the usual suspects. Um, you know, we, you know, we have interest from many uh, OEMs. Uh, we're working closely with some, several of them, as well as some fleets. Um, you know, we're not able to discuss these customer engagements. Uh, mm -hmm but we look forward to making announcements at the appropriate time. Interesting, interesting. Well, how would you rate yourself or compare yourself? I mean, obviously this is challenging for somebody who's running and building, running company and building the technology. How would you kind of rate um, some of the contenders in the field, uh, maybe the Waymos, um, maybe even Tesla, slightly different proposition, others like that. Where, where would you rank them? Uh, have you ranked them? Uh, do you do you do competitive analysis and where would you put yourself in that, in that pecking order? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly we've done uh, certain types of benchmarking, and of course, you know, uh, we go to you know trade shows and we see kind of everybody's demos and they see our demos, so you know, people can sort of get a sense. Um, so you know, I, I don't want to make any blanket statements, and certainly nobody has uh, you know complete access to some other company's technology uh, internally, so it's hard to know for sure. But as far as what's out there externally. You know, I think we had a uh, you know very successful uh, C uh, demo at CES. Um, I think uh, I, I can dare say we had the best perception demo at CES. Nice. Um, so that was, I think, pretty successful. Um, what was your demo? What did you do? Um, yeah. So we had. Uh, so actually, a lot of these videos are now up up online on our website, et cetera. But uh, these were 
uh, kind of semantic segmentation tasks. So essentially, you know, uh, predicting what every single pixel in an image uh, corresponds to, which kind of object it is. These are, you know, pretty challenging, uh, you know, very detailed computer vision problems where essentially it's you're getting kind of complete understanding of an image in a, in a 2D sense at least. We also mm -hmm. have 3D, uh, 3D uh, information being predicted. We did some highway driving, you know, we, uh, on Vegas roads that had some challenging uh, bot stats and kind of aggressive Vegas drivers. So, we did a <laughs> bunch of over there. so, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that you know, uh, one example I can give right is sort of, um, you know, this uh, when you train neural networks on a lot of data. Uh, and I'm talking like you know tens of millions of images or more for semantic segmentation, you know, which is really something that's pretty pretty hard to accomplish using traditional methods because it'd be far too expensive. What you get is something kind of much more crisp and stable in your predictions, and so that's one thing that we can definitely tell we're doing better um, than some of the other uh, competitors. Um, and uh, you know, I think people that work on the problem can also kind of tell right away when they look at the predictions. Uh, but again, maybe that's a bit of a technical point. But you know, we've certainly done uh, competitor benchmarking internally. Uh, you know, um, we're not kind of talking about that yet. <laughs> but um, you can look forward maybe to certain announce announcements from us uh, in the near future about that. Okay, I look forward to that definitely. Now, it's not what you're doing is not just about autonomous cars on public roads. You're actually building software that can be used for autonomous robots as well, uh, different types of vehicles as well. Is that correct? That's that's right. Um, you, you know, when we first started Helm AI. Um, a few years ago, we kind of saw the potential for many markets, including self-driving cars, drones, consumer robots, uh, kind of robotics at large, and you know even something like retail, like you know like the Amazon Go concept or uh, fields like medical imaging. So there's a lot of applications. I mean, we picked Thomas Driving because of the market size and mm -hmm. that was a clear need for advanced AI technology. And you know we also saw uh, certain specialized uh, problems at the time that we were confident we could solve. Uh, we, we didn't know exactly how general our technology would be, uh, but it turned out to be quite general. And so there's actually no difference in applying it to, you know, arbitrary object categories for, you know, perception or intent prediction kind of across the board. And so, uh, you know, that opens up a lot of possibilities. And I, I think uh, advances in, you know, unsupervised learning, like deep teaching or other approaches uh, can be, you know, highly disruptive technologies across uh, several uh, trillion dollar markets. Talk yeah. about some of those. I mean, uh, obviously there's a big need for delivery robots uh, in the near future, other things like that, but talk about some of those tri trillion dollar markets. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good example, right? Uh, uh, delivery, uh, you know, both like land-based and, uh, you know, air-based uh, is certainly gonna be a market that gets uh, disrupted as uh, autonomy kind of comes to fruition. Um, and, uh, you know, the bottlenecks there are essentially the same thing that I that I mentioned before, right? The, the sophistication of your AI stack will determine whether uh, these technologies can be used at scale, right? Mm -hmm. so actually uh, handle all of the, I mean, there, you know, there are massive liability issues with deploying uh, at, at scale yes. fleet. Right? And so you have yeah. to be ready. So yeah, safe, safety is gonna be, is gonna be king. And, uh, you know, so is interpretability and cost. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we, we see quite a lot of potential, uh, quite a lot of potential there. Uh, and, you know, just, you know, general robotics, like, you know, consumer, consumer robotics, right. Eventually we'll have sort of, uh, robots helping us in, in various ways, or, you know, there's even ways to kind of automate manufacturing, right. So, which mm -hmm. is certainly relevant today. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to see quite a lot of, uh, activity in these markets uh, this decade. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And now, of course, the question that every self-driving uh, startup hates, um, <laughs> the timeline question. Um, give us your current kind of best guess estimate for level five autonomy for self-driving cars basically going just about anywhere uh, they want to go, wherever their driver wants them to go, their owner wants them to go uh, by themselves. So, yeah, I mean, so I think like uh, level five is, is it kind of depends how you interpret it, right? So, uh, but, I'll, but I'll answer the question. So if you mean level five, like literally going anywhere in a sense of like uh, being able to go like, you know, off-roading in the jungle or <laughs> like driving on the moon, 
uh, without knowing ahead of time what the task is, then I think that you know an AI system that can do that would be on par with a human in many ways, and you know potentially could be AI complete, meaning that it could be as hard as solving uh, general intelligence. Um, so you know that's kind of a controversial topic, and so you know nobody knows for sure, but you know could happen within fifteen years. I don't know. Um, uh, certainly, I think you know computer vision will be solved to kind of human levels of performance maybe within a few years, kind of along the way, and uh, unsupervised learning is certainly going to play a big, pretty big role in that. But you know, but I do want to make distinction between like L five and L four. Like I think they're different, right? Like L four saying, okay, we're going to drive on just uh, you know certain control access highways. That's going to happen well before fifteen years, right? That, I mean, mm -hmm. again, from, from a safety perspective, I think that's already achievable quite soon, but really the bottleneck is going to be kind of liability and how to tackle that. And, you know, if the government kind of steps up and actually puts in place, uh, you know, similar laws as to what like, the aviation industry has, then it could really take off sooner because uh, then you're kind of defining what exactly it means because uh, inevitably accidents will happen. Right. And uh, you're going to have to go to a court of law and explain uh, sort of uh, what exactly happened. And if an AI system is not fully prepared for some corner case, that, that's going to be a very, very tough uh, tough situation. And so that's kind of really where the bottleneck, I think, will be for when we can deploy these systems safely. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you for your time. It's been interesting. Thanks for having me. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you as well, listeners and viewers for joining us on Tech First, whatever platform you're on, please like, subscribe, share, share, comment. If you're on the podcast, you like it, please rate it, review it. And thanks. Until next time, this is John Goodseer with Tech First.